Okay, so welcome everybody. Today we have Moe Minut Mukni, I hope I'm pronouncing that well, uh, with us. He is a researcher at ETH Zurich, uh, working in the group of Andres Krause. Um, he has been working, uh, his, yeah, he has had productive uh, PhD, uh, a lot of interesting papers. Uh, no, notably, I know him for uh, uh, using the terminal point processes, uh, and post processing step to improve diversity in the batching. Uh, but yeah, uh, there is plenty more uh, where that came from. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward to hearing what you are going to tell us about uh, uh, MCMC world uh, intersection with Bayesian optimization. So, with that, uh, perhaps you can start with your talk. Thank you very much for very kind introduction. And also thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, to your seminar. I'm very happy to give a talk. So as you've heard, uh, indeed, my name is Moimir and uh, I defended my PhD a couple of, uh, couple of months ago. And most, uh, mostly I've been working on experiment design. Um, as, uh, and as already have been said, kind of various aspects of it. But here in this talk, I decided to focus on um, experiment design, especially connected to Markov chains or Markov decision processes. So I'll be presenting uh, more or less like a unified uh, research direction rather than a single paper. So this, this work is based effectively on three to four published works. Um, all of them are uh, joint work with my supervisor, Andreas Krause, and uh, the others are also uh, are joint with uh, you know either uh, past colleagues, new colleagues, or uh, even collaborators from Imperial College London. So I, th I will try to kind of give credit to uh, where were appropriate and in the respective slides. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start with the main, with the topic of today. So first, before we start, I want to introduce what is an experimental design, or to better say, statistical experimental design. So let's imagine a typical statistical pipeline. We have data. Given the data, we perform some analysis statistics and machine learning and get insights from these. Then management does some cost and benefit analysis, takes these insights and makes decisions. Now, let us suppose, what if we don't have all the data and we can decide what data we need in order to perform these decisions correctly. So this is usually known as statistics as experiment design, this type of problem. Now, if the decisions further influence what data we uh, we acquire in a sense that we kind of close the loop and we iterate in a couple of uh, iterative in an iterative fashion this is usually referred to as adaptive experiment design so what what data we should choose depends on a couple of factors for example the first factor what is the most important is what do we want to do with it uh what we can get and what information we already have so all of these aspects kind of been all of these questions uh, have been kind of the at the cornerstone of understanding during my PhD and also later. Uh, but now we will focus on one specific aspect, and that's what if there is only a specific way that uh, there, or there is only a specific data we can get. Namely, that if the individual decisions are policies themselves. So as you can see, this in fact defines some kind of sequential decision making where we define a policy. But here, the individual decisions that you see here, you know, kind of depicted in a pictogram, as a pictogram, are the policies themselves. But before we go there, let me kind of give you some background on what is experiment design in more detail. So, uh, so first, what we need is a functional relationship. So, what the uh, second thing what we need is, as I said, what we want to do with it, so some kind of task or utility that we need an observational model, and that we need space of possible experiments. So given all these four things, the problem is completely specified. Whether in the Markov chains, whether it's with policies, whether not with policies, this is kind of always, this, this quadrat um, is always needed to specify. So functional relationship, this could be thought of like, for example, uh, if I have some inputs and some outputs, what is, a, what is the structural relationship between these two? So you could think of them as some kind of smoothness, so, for example, I believe that a lot of you are familiar with Gaussian process modeling, so that would be mean that what kernel we choose there. But the kernel does not need to be just modeling smoothness, can be as exotic as, for example, modeling similarity between uh, different protein molecules. So in this work or in this talk, we will just focus on RKHS, 
which is loosely uh, in a, in a, which is loosely said and it could uh, frequently is equivalent of Gaussian processes uh, when we put the prior on beta. So as I write this here, um, it looks like as if this was a completely parametric form where this inner product is, uh, where there is this theta is the vector. But in fact, what I mean by this is uh, that, that uh, the theta is in fact uh, an element of an even possibly infinitely dimensional Hilbert space. I just like to write it this way. So um, uh, in some cases we, may, we might specialize to finite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces, but in, by, in, by default, the system will be always infinitely dimensional separable Hilbert space. Uh, then the task is like, for example, for example, an example of task is, for example, is reducing the uncertainty of our uh, unknown parameters identifying a maximum of this function f, or for example, even hypothesis testing. Uh, observation model, what we mean by this is effectively given our inputs, which is x, what we can change, our experiments, we observe some y, and the random relationship between x and y is the observational model. This is usually specified using a likelihood. If we are unfortunate enough that we don't know the likelihood, we could just say that the kind of noise process is, uh, belongs to a certain subfamily, such as sub portion, and and lastly, we need to specify space of experiments. And then we kind of special here that we will focus on policies and what are the restrictions on the space of experiments we can do. So a couple of examples, um, some relevant for this talk, some not so much. One example is environmental monitoring. So here and the model are positive, uh, positive smooth functions. Uh, the task is to identify level sets. The randomness that we observe are Poisson samples, Poisson random variables where we observe counts in a certain region. So for example, this would be a uh, number of species in a certain region. And then the experiments that we do are in fact measurements of certain regions. So they are not points per se, or uh, they are in fact model sets. So for example, we would zoom on specific region here in the map and identify uh, and observe a couple of uh, point observation from the Poisson process model that we are, uh, that we are uh, you know, using to model the process at hand. Another thing could be inferring uh, differential equations. So this is very important, for example, in, in pharmacokinetic studies, when people try to determine dosage of, uh, of medications. So here, the model is parametric differential equation model with parameters that we don't know. The task is to reduce the uncertainty around these parameters. Then we, of course, have some pa patient variations. So uh, each patient is a bit different. We can capture this using some kind of well-parametrized uh, likelihood family. And then the question, the action space that we want to if we want to understand is when when should we measure? When should we interact with the patient? And for example, gross blood, you know, to understand his level of medication um, over time. So of course we don't want to you know interact with the patient. We don't want to draw blood all the, uh, frequently, or uh, we want to do it very few times. But also we want to do it at informative intervals. And you know, to do this, we want to kind of minimize the size of the study and minimize the intervention that we do to the patients but also maximize the statistical power at kind of understanding the, uh, the, the parameters at hand. So, so this, this second example already has kind of the flavor of sequential decision-making whereby these measurement times, they are ordered in time and previous measurement times can influence the new times. But let's, uh, let's not go there yet. So maybe let's kind of, so this has been so far dry, so let's kind of initiate the whole process. So there's some, suppose that there's some unknown parameter, theta star, which could be potentially an infinite dimensional, a member of an infinitely dimensional Hilbert space, that we observe these y's as a queries. So we query x to observe a y using the conditional likelihood model. Then there is an estimator. This estimate depends on measurements that we stack together and call it x. Then there are the outcomes of these measurements, which we call y. And with these, we define a utility. A utility is, some, is a function that takes our estimate and the true value produces um, produces a value that represents how well we are at achieving our task. Uh, so this quantity um, is random due to the estimator being random because the data is random. So we need to deal somehow with this. So what usually people do, and this is also what we will do, we take the expected utility. So we take expectation under the possible outcomes that can occur, and we will deal with this expected utility. Notice that this expected utility is um, is actually realized in a space which is either vectorized or a matrix, depending on uh, depending on the utility. So we need to somehow create uh, put it on a space where we can define a total order because we want to estimate what is a good um, in the end what we would like to uh, understand are what are good measurements. So we need to understand okay this is a bad measurement. So we need to make an order between them. 
So what we do, we do a classical setup, which is called scalarization, where we scalarize the expected utility in order to arrive at the final experimental design problem, which is trying to maximize the expected scalarized uh, utility uh, subject to some uh, budget constraints. This is classical experiment design problem. By the way, everything that I'm saying here without, if I'm not specifically saying any references, this is folklore. This is something which is known uh, since perhaps even 40, 50 years uh, in, in the literature. I'm just kind of giving a background on as to, as to this problem. So this experimental design problem has been tackled you know, since I think 50s or maybe even actually this, this whole goes back to Fisher. Not sure if exactly in this form, but it goes really, really long, long time back. But there are two problems with this experiment design, uh, this objective here, which if we could solve it, that would be great. But unfortunately, we can't. The first problem is that this constraint on the budget introduces an empty hat <coughs> combinatorial problem. A second problem is that it depends on something we don't know. It depends on the unknown parameter theta star. So we need to kind of address these two things. And depending on how we address them, they might be more recent, but still not completely known. So first of all, like there's a proof that this, in fact, is an empty hat problem. So in any non-trivial instantiation of this problem is actually empty hat, even very, very simple instantiations. Uh, of this problem are empty hat, and uh, but we can, in order to solve them, we can uh, resort to relaxation techniques and find an epsilon, epsilon closed solution um, kind of in polynomial time. So this can be achieved through this relaxation technique. So well, what do I mean by relaxation technique is that, for example, suppose that we have uh, our stacked observation X. So now we have a set of these observations. Uh, there, are t, there are capital T of them. So this means that we have t, uh, capital T observations. Now we can represent them as a count. So we can count how many times we observe the first element from the set, second element of the set, third element set, and, and so forth. So we can represent it kind of an equivalent representation of these two, two, uh, two problems. Then we take this and we can take these counts and we can represent them as fractional counts. So as a fraction over the whole budget. Still, this is perfectly equivalent to the original representation. But at the last step, we do, we do so-called relaxation where we relax these fractional counts to be any continuous variables between zero and one, such they have to sum to, uh, such they have to sum to all of, all of them have to sum to one. So this means that effectively this eta variable that we introduced, which is the relaxation that we'll be uh, using from now on, it has to belong into a simplex over all the possible experimental measurements that we can do. So now the function is continuous. It's now the function that we have here, if we, if we Kind of plug it in, plug this representation in is a continuous function of eta, and we can solve it using continuous time, the continuous, uh, continuous optimization, and hopefully that works better. As we'll see in many pieces, this does. Uh, the second problem where the function depends on something which we don't know can be addressed by building an uncertain set over the unknown thing, and then, for example, being a robust and adaptive. So, for example, instead of optimizing the objective, um, uh, the optimizing the worst case objective. For example, we take the minimum over all possible utilities in our uncertainty set, and then we maximize our uh, utility for that. So this would be like a simple thing. This is not by means of the only thing which one can do, but this is an example how this can be dealt with. Now, if we are also adaptive, we can also update our uncertainty set and kind of refine this objective more. I will see more on this. So now uh, let's give an example. So unknown parameter, query as before. Suppose that our estimate is heteroscedastically squares. So now we can uh, we can optimize heteroscedastically squares. I think everybody knows kind of how this looks, looks looks like. The utility is covariance of residuals, meaning that we would like to understand the squared residuals and covariance between them. Um, so then, if we take the expectation over this utility, what we get it looks kind of very familiar. Looks something like an information matrix. So like some people call this information matrix. Uh, normalized by variances. And the variances, you can see they're actually parameterized by something which we don't know. So the variances are unknown, hence heteroscedastically squares. And what we can now do, we can minimize, um, we can minimize the, we can we can scalarize the expected utility and it minimize it. So namely, this is kind of the, sc the scalarization, for example, if we want to minimize the total squared error, looks like this. So this is our objective. Now you can see that the objective depends on the X, which is this combinatorial set object that we don't know how to optimize over, but we can perform the scalarization with the technique that we just introduced. 
Ah, so one thing there. So now here we are maximizing the inverse of the expected squared residuals, right? So this, the the larger this is, the less error, the less total squared error we have. So if you cannot go live, we want to maximize this. So the relaxation introduces, uh, intro now changes the sum. Now we sum over all elements of our experimental set, and also changes the variable which we optimize, which becomes this eta. So now this function. Uh, and also what we do, we also take the, the total budget out. So this just happens through the, the, the structure of the problem. So now this function is concave function. We maximize it. So this is completely practical problem that we can solve using off-the-shelf con convex solvers. For example, like inferior point methods can do this off-the-shelf. Uh, so how do we deal with the dependence on unknown? So for example, we can be robust with respect to some uncertainty set. So we just take the minimum over the uncertainty set. And this will kind of uh, make sure that uh, we are still doing something which is, in the worst case, a good idea. So now if we take a minimum over all these possible concave functions, minimum of concave functions is concave over a compact set. So again, we end up with something which in the end has the complexity of a convex optimization problem, which can be solved in polynomial time. So that's perfect. So we at least managed to solve these two problems where we get got rid of the empty hardness, and uh, we got and we got rid of kind of the uncertainty, uh, the unknown unknown specification. So can we kind of generalize this? And in fact, we can generalize it. Uh, so the relaxation can be done by defining so-called relaxed experimental design problem, where at iteration t, knowing the star with budget t, we uh, perform uh, the following optimization problem. Where this is the design, what kind of what, what we actually want to execute. This is our optimization variable. Then we have a relaxation function. So previously, you can see here in the green what was the previous relaxation function. But this depends really on there are many possible relaxations, and they are all parameterized by this relaxation function. You can choose which one you want, but nearly always there is a kind of a very good first choice. For example, this is one which occurs in nearly in all objectives that I uh, dealt with, then the rest of the function is the same. So the relaxed objective looks the same as the original objective, just these two things are introduced. And since this is a relaxation, what we need to ensure that it's a relaxation between integral points, we need to make sure that if we round or if we are at one of the points which can be rounded into a fractional point, it's actually equal to the original expected, the original experimental design problem, the unrounded one. So this is true for any kind of uh, continue the relaxation technique that at the points of the lattice, these two coincide. Now notice we will call this function from now on, it's a relaxed experimental design problem, we'll call it from now on f. Uh, the, depending on the unknown, this it, it will, we will not delve this into too much, but this can be the, this can be kind of addressed by planning. Uh, there are many forms of planning. You can do pessimistic, optimistic, or average planning. So this also coincides more or less with the bait, with the, like the decision theory where average planning would correspond to something like a base risk. Uh, optimism is often seen in bandit literature because it leads to consistent schemes. And pessimist, pessimism is, for example, of, uh, motivated by robust complex optimization. So this is how we kind of deal with the unknown. Um, and then the, kind of the meta algorithm works like this. We solve the allocation using complex optimization. Then we round it somehow. We will not discuss this too much, but uh, because there will be a very good choice for the uh, for the for the what we what we do later, but th there are many possible rounding schemes. But one example of rounding scheme is, for example, a greedy algorithm. Then we execute partially, so we execute only a couple of our observations, maybe just the most important ones for a small budget. Then we update our belief on the uncertain parameter, and then we redo the whole optimization again. So this is kind of the master algorithm that we'll be following here. I will specialize it. So so this is abstract. And I'm just providing this abstract context so that you understand that this, that what we are going to see has been derived through a very general scheme of decision theory and kind of experimental design procedure or the experimental design theory. So there are a couple of, there are a lot of different objectives that the one can deal with. So kind of the process that we will be talking about is agnostic to the objective or utility that we will want to, want to do. So it's general experimental design or mark chain. Right, so it can be any goal. One goal, which is, uh, for example, is maximize the function. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with this problem because this actually coincides with 
so called what we call Bayesian optimization or bandit optimization, where the right performance metric is cumulative rigorous. So in that case, this function f becomes is effectively linear in the allocation procedure or in the allocation eta or the relaxation eta. And with optimistic planning, this is exactly equal to the upper confidence bound algorithm. So but this is kind of relation to classical Bayesian optimization is by choosing a specific utility f. Another goal could be identifying the maximum. Maximum. This is sometimes known as also best arm identification. In that case, one can use also a certain utility f. This has been derived by fees and uh, was published in 2019. And this is effectively, again, optimal kind of hypo It's motivated by optimal hypothesis testing of whether an arm is a maximizer or not on finite domains. So again, with the specific, what I want, the, the details are not very important. What is important is that there exists a utility f, which can be relaxed and which can be put into this framework in order to do exactly this goal, identify maximizers. Another goal, which we already seen, is to reduce the uncertainty. A popular examples of these are, for example, A or B design, perhaps the B design you've maybe seen in the context of Bayesian experimental design, but this also falls in here, and it's a specific choice of a utility function. Another thing is, uh, is reducing uncertainty in a specific region, for example, with a specific uh, spatial average, interested in reducing uncertainty in spatial average, uh, reducing uncertainty of any linear operators, for example, reducing the uncertainty of the integral of a function or a gradient of a function. So all these linear operators are possible. And that also has can be formalized as a specific utility of this problem. Uh, hypothesis testing also can be formulated as a utility and many others. So if you're interested in this and you're interested whether you can apply experimental design problem on your specific problem, I've tried to provide some kind of assortment of these known utilities in my PhD thesis, which will become a public, I believe, shortly, maybe a couple of weeks. So the university will publish this in the research collection, uh, maybe in a week or two. So have a look. There are a lot of other applications of this framework, and they lead to very interesting algorithms and schemes. But now uh, let's go to the topic of, you know, now concretely to the topic of this talk, which is experiment design in Markov chains. So what we mean by this, so we, we create a Markov chain process where we know a transition kernel to given our state X and our action A. When we execute it, there is the transition model, which we know pre a priori, that transfers us into the next state. Uh, at every single of these transitions, we observe some, we observe this unknown function, which we already introduced, but now the function is a function of x and also a, not just of x as previously, not just function of x previously. Uh, the interaction that we can do now, so we can only execute a policy to interact with the environment. We couldn't, we cannot, for example, do uh, like we previously, you can pick any possible experiment. Now, depending on what state we are in, we have to follow a certain trajectory. So for example, if we are in this state and we play this action, there's, then we get into this state. And this, and then at the same time, we kind of observe only um, you know, information through this transition. We, we cannot kind of go into arbitrary possible, make arbitrary possible uh, step. So this kind of will necessitate some sort of a planning so that we make sure that we can execute the action that we find informative in future. So what this generates in this kind of toy environment where the pictograms are representing different uh, types of states are trajectories that we have to follow in order to make sure that we are following the dynamics. So as I said, classically, we could pick any X and A. Here, we have to follow the dynamics. So further assume that the length of the episode that we are playing is some H, and there will be T episodes. So we kind of execute, we interact with this problem in an episodic fashion. Uh, so we don't need to be ergodic. We, we really, you know, we start the episode somewhat, we end the episode somewhat, we restart. So could be that the system breaks or something like that. So this, this is also allowed in this framework. Now to each state, we associate features. These features are effectively what define at the, at kind of the, the features of the kernel that are, defining, that are defining the function f as a function of the state and action pairs. And you could think of it as they, as a they defining the kernel. So here in this pictorial example, they just mean they're just indicator functions of whether the state is uh, has a specific pictogram. But uh, this will be just a kind of a running toy example. This will be not uh, a real, real deal. 
So the ninth solution to deal with this problem is to optimize all the trajectories. So since we cannot, uh, since we can, cannot execute specific states, what we can do, we can enumerate all possible trajectories and then try to find policy which reproduces exactly those trajectories which are good for our utility. However, this leads into exponential blow up in variables as it's not really attractive. Second problem is that if we, can, if we have stochastic dynamics, so the transition kernel is not deterministic, we might not be able to pick the specific trajectory which we find to be the most important informative. So how do we deal with this problem? So what we want to actually arrive at is a tractable, but we need that we can actually calculate them in polynomial time, sequence of history dependent policies. So we want to inform the choice by our executed policies such that the visit states, the states that we have in our system, converge to some sort of optimal visitation of states. So what do we mean by this optimal visitation? So how do we deal with this combinatorial space of trajectories? So combinatorial space of trajectories forms, you can, you can think of it like a simplex of probability over, over trajectories. This is something, a very, very large combinatorial object. And it's very, very tempting to, in the problem that we had before, just to replace the simplex over states, just to simply replace it over uh, simplex over trajectories. But this is effectively not necessary because the only thing that we need to care about is visitation of states. If we look at our objective, we can see clearly that our objective depends only on the pairs X and A. It doesn't depend on specific trajectory. In fact, what we can just summarize this is by kind of summary statistics, which depends on the visitation. We don't need the specific order in the trajectory in order to um, in order to find the optimum. So then, the only thing what we need to do is look at the building blocks of these uh, of these trajectories, which are states and actions, which is a much more convenient much more convenient object. is not com combinatorial in the horizon time. So in fact. If we look at this object, which determines uh, visitations of our Markov chain, it turns out that we can classify all possible visitations that are allowable given our dynamics in a chain. And these all possible visitations which are allowed can be summarized by so-called what people, what people refer to as state action visitation polytope. I mean, it looks kind of uh, challenging here, but if you look at the equations, this just means that this is a probability distribution and this is effectively a flow constraint that if I propagate my uh, propagate my <clears throat> my uh, probability states from uh, horizon uh, to future, I have to maintain kind of some old probability. So it's actually a very simple uh, constraint to define. And this summarizes all possible allowable visitations that we can achieve. This is what we can achieve. We cannot achieve anything better than this. So what in fact this is, is a subset on the simplex is defined over all possible states and action. But it's a subset that we can optimize over. So now this seems like a tempting thing to just replace in the previous optimization problem, the X and X across A with this D. And in fact, this is what we will do. But why can we do this? So first of all, this is very nice. This is a convex polytope. Just uh, so this super nice. Another thing is this is very well studied object in the RL. And this means that there are efficient solvers for these linear problems, very, very efficient, such as policy iteration, value iteration, and a lot of others. I mean, effectively, um, the classical RL problem is just a, prop, a, linear, a linear optimization problem on this polytope. So, and it turns out that this polytope, though exponentially many, though might have exponentially many vertices, um, exponentially many faces, is still efficiently solvable with the kind of off the shelf algorithms. Now, if you think more in terms of policies, like these vectors, these vectors which tell you given a state, what is the probability of the next action? In fact, I'm with you. So there is a dual representation of the state action visitations and with these policy representations. So if we want to get the state action visitation, what we just need to do, we need to just forward propagate our Markov chain in order with the policy uh, pi uh, in order to get our visitations. And if we, on the other hand, if we want to get a policy representation from our state action visitation, we can do this just by marginalization. So what this also means, if you look at this policy that I defined through marginalization, this policy is a Markov policy. So this means that any B, any state action visitation can be in fact yeah, realized by a Markov policy. So the optimization problem that we are going to concern, that we are going to concern uh, with, in fact, can be actually 
uh, is actually supported or can be solved by a Markov policy. Okay, so let's formulate that optimization problem over this state action of dissipation. So I just took the equation from a previous round and I just replaced, I just replaced the I just replace the domain over which we optimize now to the restriction of all any possible visitations. Now, what does this look like? For example, in this toy example, this looks like this. It's a probability distribution over states. And now given this optimal visitation distribution, we can decide, define even our kind of policy that actually does this. The objective is nothing else than what we already saw in the general setup. It just changes the constraint. So good news, yeah, it was previously convex, now it's convex. The convex poly, it's a convex polytope, so all of this is convex. So what might be slightly challenging is now that the constraint description is complicated. In fact, it's a very complicated polytope, but they're efficient solvers, but they're just efficient linear solvers, not efficient convex solvers. So classical solution that many people found out a couple of years ago is Frank Wolf is able to solve, uh, optimize any, any convex function by decomposing into set of class, uh, set sequence of linear optimization problems where these linear problem, optimization problems can be now identified as a, as, a, as a reinforcement learning problem. So now the solution is easy. We can just use Frank Wolf on this objective and solve each problem in the, uh, solve the sequence of these RL problems using our favorite RL algorithm. Then what we end up with, the, kind of as, we build, as we build our optimization variable that we, uh, that we create using <clears throat> Frank, uh, that we that we build up using Frank Wolf algorithm, we are creating so-called an object which people refer to as mixture policy, where every where every single other algorithm defines a single policy, a so-called base policy, which we hear as by I, and then we can do a convex mixture of them in uh, in the state action visitation polytope. And this will be actually the the final result that is <laughs> that is solving our original objective uh, that you see above. So the linear maximization oracle is nothing else than just solving the current linearization given the current mixture that we have. So let's say we have n elements and we have a current linearization of the objective. We linearize around this objective and just maximize this linear objective. Um, you notice that this is kind of the gradient of the objective, so linearization. That can be effectively you know, identified as a reward function in a classical RL solver. So by solving the RL problem, we find one mixture component find the new RL mixture component, we add it to the mixture and we iterate. In this way, we can just solve the original problem although being convex on the, uh, some people refer to this as convex reinforcement learning. So notice that so far there was uh, no interaction with the system. We are just we are just computing. We're just computing the policy that we want to interact with. So now uh, how do we interact with the system in these Markov chains? Because we, you know, we calculate, we calculate this policy, what do we do with this policy? So now let's let's go through this algorithm. We already see, see most of parts of this algorithm, so the, the, it actually will be not that challenging to understand. So here, this is all the visited states that we've seen so far. This is all the states that we visited and interacted with the system. We've been there, and we're just counting that we've been there. And this variable just tells us how many, how many times we've been in the state X playing action A, it's our past visitations. And you can see that we are trying to find an improvement to this visitation. So we are not trying to optimize directly the visitation, but we already visit many states. So perhaps we already are very close to the optimal visitation, and we are just trying to improve the visitation that we've seen all so far. Then we define this objective called G uh, using, let's say, robust planning in this case, and we try to solve it. And this is exactly the solution is exactly the algorithm that we talked about using this Frank Wolf and sequence of LMO oracles. So now, having solved, we found the policy that we want, which constitutes a lot of these base policies. We can summarize them using marginalization. We have one mark of policy. Now, what do we do with this one mark of policy? The only thing we, so we, we execute it. We execute it and we get one trajectory. We update, as we saw, the visited states because we executed the trajectory. Right? So we can count the states that we visited in the trajectory and update it. We also observe some feedback. So we update our uncertainty set so that we can improve our robust planning and iterate like this. And this way, we eventually are converging to the optimal visitation of, this, of these states. So kind of why is this a good idea? We can even prove formally that this is, this is in fact converging. 
So under the assumption of the theorem that F is concave smooth that sufficient F possesses sufficient smoothness, we can show that there is an optimum visitation we want to converge to uh, under the unknown parameter. So this is kind of special to the setting that we're proving a convergence under parameter that we don't know. Um, and depends effectively on a couple of couple of loss terms. One, this is just initialization error, which decreases as one over tau. Then we have a rounding error, which, which we can prove increases as a square root of d. Then we have a confidence set width. So the uncertainty quantification that we are doing has to be in such a way that the and it has to interact with the with the observed points in such a way this confidence that is going down. And then the conclusion that we can reach, the last term is not important, the last term is not dominating. But the conclusion we can reach that as long as the uncertainty set is going down, which we have to prove kind of additionally, but this is kind of easy for specific, this one, one has to do for every specific uh, case separately. But unless uh, as long as this is true, uh, we decrease the overall error as one over square root d. So kind of this procedure is able to converge into optimal visitation, um, optimal vis visitation of states um, as we progress with episode episodes. Okay. So um, maybe some comments on kind of difficulty of this process. So the uh, and I, some comments of what's happening. So the whole process can be summarized in the same way that every single round, at every single episode, we calculate and execute a Markov policy. But this Markov policy, that this the set of these Markov policies is history dependent, but not in a sense that it includes the history in the state, but the dependence is through the objective. As you saw, we are kind of only learning a correction to the good visitation, um, for good visitation from uh, from uh, the of the visitation that we already had so far. So in a sense, through the objective, we are able to introduce a history dependence on the objective, which is very, 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 very elegant. Because if we introduce the history through the state representation, this problem would be exponentially intractable. Would it kind of blow up with the all possible histories? But this way. Every single object that we are calculating and executing is actually polynomially tractable. It's polynomially tractable, but yet still depends on the history. So if we look at the overall history, overall policy, like all of them, since they are uh, history dependent, as, as a whole, they are not Markovian. But every single time you're following a Markovian policy, which is changing at every single episode or even every single round. This is still possible, as we'll discuss. So, now the question is, all of this, we proved this convergence. So, so a couple of comments on this, like that we proved the convergence to the relaxed objective. Can we say something about the unrelaxed objective like we said previously? And in fact, this is kind of the statement that we proved previously that we converge, that the empirical visitation is converging to the optimal visita relaxed visitation. But is it also converging to the optimal non-relaxed objective? And in fact, we can show that the error that we are proving is in fact that we are even converging to the optimal unrelaxed objective, which is a much more complicated object that uh, effectively samples trajectories and then we take, so it samples trajectories from the from the optimal policy and then takes the expectation over the whole function and empirical, visit, empirical visitation here. So it's kind of a more, more, more difficult baseline, but what we are showing is that if we are converging on our metric that we proved, we're also converging on this metric. Could be that we could be converging faster on that metric using a different method, but we are <laughs> nevertheless converging. So this is again optimal policy of the unrelaxed objective. So how difficult is this problem? This is some, that's a problem that we we studied with uh, with a colleague of mine, Manish, and for a, even for a known objective, so there's no unknown here, uh, even imposing additional structure which could be helpful, like submodularity on the set function, we showed that this problem the original experiment designed on MDT without any relaxation, uh, this problem, yeah. so this is this is what I mean formally by a non-relaxed objective where the expectation is outside instead of inside, which we which we kind of move through the end, through the Jensen inequality here in this step. So if this problem, in fact, is actually, we can actually characterize the optimal solution to this. It's non-Markovian policy, and it's surprisingly deterministic. Uh, but it's interactable. And even it's actually the interactability of this problem is even bigger than interactability of the original problem. So since this problem is a subset of the original problem, you, know, you define a trivial Markov chain, it's NP hard to solve. But what we can even show that it's NP hard to find a multiplicative approximation to this. 
um, multiplicate uh, with a constant factor. So even even this, so it's even if we look at combinatorially, the hardness of this problem is actually even more difficult than the original um, at, at, than the original uh, than the original original experimental design problem. But as you can see, there are relaxation techniques which can lead to kind of interesting solutions that are able to converge. Maybe not you know not as competitive as um, as uh, as you know as you might hope. But still, nevertheless, at, at least eventually converging into the optimal, uh, optimal, uh, even analyzed policy. I Good. A question, a question about that. So, in, in the, yeah, am I correct? But, but you assume that there you have a finite number of episodes, the large yes. So, the, the convergence proof was for that budget or letting it to go to the limit? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in fact, if you, for example, fix a budget, so let's say that you fix a budget and you let the budget increase, then you can show that as you increase budget, as you in, as you keep increase, as you increase a budget for any fixed budget, you are getting closer and closer to the optimal allocation. So, for example, if you have sufficiently big budget, you'll be sufficiently, eventually, sufficiently close to the optimal allocation. Okay, so it has some many time guarantees. Um. So this depends. So if you want an anytime guarantee, it's possible. It's possible. But here, as I stated, it is not necessarily an anytime guarantee. This effectively means that for any T that you pick, but it doesn't mean that it holds for any for any time. Because I mean, but it can be made, but just this statement, I mean, yes, it can be made anytime. This this the answer. Yeah. Okay. You just have to uh, pick some some parameters like the learning rate. You have to in this triangle. We have to pick in a specific way, you know, to make sure that uh, that this is any time, but it can be made any time. Good. Um, so now some people claim that this experiment design is just opti about optimizing constants, and in fact it's true. And this is actually important to notice. So imagine. So look at let's look at the previous uh, you know a relaxed experimental design problem that we had. And that we defined here. So you see that dependence on T is outside. So this is kind of very, very important. And also relates to the previous question, whereas this is independent of T, or it can be made independent of T. So what does this mean? So let's let, let, let's turn to the example of this heteroscedastic linear regression. So if we have F of eta, this is this is what the what the utility looks like. Uh, and in fact, it is proportional to the total squared error of our estimator. Uh, in fact, for any time t, uh, in this case, and what you can see here that by maximizing this, we are minimizing the error, but we are not changing the rate that we decrease that uh, we decrease the error weight, so the one over t stays the same. So in fact, what we are doing, we are actually optimizing the constant. The constant can be arbitrarily bad, but nevertheless, we are optimizing a constant. So if we could optimize this exactly, uh, the rate doesn't change. What changes is just a constant. So what we are effectively showing is that we are converging to the optimal constant over time. So the previous result, the previous theorem, shows that we are eventually converging to the optimal constant. So if we are interested in the overall error convergence, we need to combine these two things together. Just wanted to kind of you know bring this up that I think this is important to understand that this is all about constants and optimal constants. So uh, kind of examples of this uh, Markov decision processes. So for example, in spatial monitoring, we want to explore diverse parts of a landscape to determine, let's say, habitable species. So in this case, this is a African uh, small tree uh, that uh, comes from a very popular statistic data set. So this is a completely kind of simulated story here. Uh, so here we model the point observations of a specific tree as a Poisson point process. We model uh, the occurrence of these uh, events as a spatial rate function that uh, is, is smooth and the smoothness is defined through an RKHS kernel. You can see it depicted here on the left. And the features of this space effectively induce some kind of clustering that some regions are very similar to each other and others are different from each other. What you want is you know, to understand the habitat as a, as a factor of these spatial features is to have a very diverse coverage of this problem. So, we are, and we observe these observations as a Poisson process. 
So we can use the exploration objective or the one where we want to minimize the uncertainty over a problem. And we can try to opt we can we can try to deploy, for example, like a drone that has to traverse the forest and scan and count the number of trees. And we can look at how fast we are converging to the optimal constant again. So all of this is yet an, the uncertainty yet is decreasing as one over t. But on top of that, there is also optimization of the constant happening. And these two algorithms are effectively just the framework we talked about, which is with different parameters. And the two things you can notice here is that there is an optimal design gap. So all the algorithms which perform optim some sort of optimal design are much, much better than just random, which is not converging to the optimal constant. Co random has a different constant, which is not optimal. And then there's an adaptivity gap. So if, in case we use an adaptive algorithm, which is trying to update the uncertain parts in the algorithm, we can even improve, uh, we can improve even on that. So kind of this is uh, one example where Markov chains are important, where we are using the transition between these individual uh, cells in the map to be dictated, let's say, by some dynamics that the drone can follow. Another example could be uh, that we kind of worked with with uh, with uh, colleagues at Imperial College, with Jose and, and Ruth, is optimizing batch chemical reactors. So there, the, the, the motivation is that there's a kind of complicated reaction mechanism that we want to model using nonlinear dynamics and uh, in a data-driven fashion. I think because what we want to understand is identify the best reaction parameters. So this is the maximum identification problem. So the, the, these reactors are uh, very complex, but let me present a very, very big simplified version. You have effectively two reactants which flow in and you can control their flow, their ratio, and you can also control the outflow, how much, uh, how much actually these things moving in. For example, if the outflow compared to the volume is very, uh, very small, this means that the, these chemicals inside stay for a longer time. So there are effectively two things you can choose. You can uh, you can optimize the ratio between reactants and you can also optimize how long the reaction is happening inside the reactor. But as you, for example, change the ratio between reactant and one and reactant two, you're changing it smoothly. So you are able to have some sort of like a transient information. You don't jump into completely another parameter space. You, you're smoothly changing the ratio in the same sense, you're smoothly changing so-called the residence time. So all these things are kind of able to change locally. And if classical methods would maybe even dictate huge jumps, and you would not, this first of all, this would be unphysical. And secondly, there will be strictly information suboptimal because you could learn a lot of things along the way as you keep changing. So this is what we try to demonstrate in this application in a recent publication. In, uh, this we will try to demonstrate this application in a recent publication where we show that uh, if we use an optimized utility function with this Markov chain framework, we are able to be very competitive and we are in the, uh, we are able than let's say classical like um, heuristic approaches using ex like expected improvement. And also that the framework procedure is very stable and can be executed easily. So let me skip the, uh, maybe skip the next example since we are, um, or maybe just slowly go over this. So, one th another thing is that if we want to, for example, optimize uh, some complicated physical process, quite often what happens in this case is a, is a Swiss electron laser is that the larger the parameter changes, the larger movement in X we make, the more noise we observe. So in fact, there is no restriction of what movement we can do. There's no restriction on per se movement so that the transition dynamics is, is able to traverse anywhere. But what we are able to do is to model the fact that the larger the transition, the, the worse is the noise uh, signal to noise ratio. And we are able now with modeling the state of okay, where we are and where we want to go, we're able to model the fact that we want to do maybe smaller steps. And we can do provide an optimal information trade-off between how large steps we are making and how much, um, yeah, how much how large steps are we making, you know, which uh, maximize our sort of diversity exploration in or learning about the problem and also uh, also the kind of this noise. So we provide this right balance just by kind of modeling the state. And here we can see, for example, if we used a BO problem, which we could on this problem perfectly use a BO problem with the worst case um, sigma or worst case um, noise value, noise parameter, then we would have a huge gap in terms of performance as we, for example, start modeling the state of the system. So by modeling the state, we can use much smaller values of sigma or 
more diverse, rich class of sigma, or a large, large, large class of sigmas, that and the algorithm is able to adapt to this. It's able to make smaller steps in order to get more informative measurements. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention, because I'm really running out of the time, uh, is that this has a very close parallels into model predictive control. Uh, and namely, if we if you consider, uh, so far we only talked about continuous, uh, sorry, discrete domains, uh, like discrete domains of X or discrete uh, spaces in terms of state and actions. But if you go into continuous space, um, the problem still is the same. It can still well-defined, still can be formalized. It's still in fact a convex optimization problem, but infinitely dimensional. And that's not easy to solve uh, in terms of in, in a computer. So it's still perfectly well defined, but you need to you resort to some approximation techniques to deal with this, um, deal with this infinite, infinite nature. So one way you can do you can do mixture of Gaussian normalizing flow. So these are a couple of uh, strategies that we propose. But the my most favorite is to parameterize uh, your state visitation in terms of the actions that you do. So a specific example of this: suppose you have a linear system where your next state is determined by some known linear dynamics, and what you can pick are these actions. So the policy directly is parameterized by this set of these actions. So what you can really formalize is that this framework update that we had before, you can literally write it in terms of optimizing over the actions as, to, as if you are optimizing over the state visitation polytopes. And what happens is that you get a nonlinear problem, but it's, uh, which also includes these past visit states as we had before, but it's exactly nonlinear MPC or the form that people encounter in nonlinear MPC. They have, a, but in this case, this is a non convex objective. Most of the problems in MPC are convex and can be easily quickly solvable. But the challenges are the same. And in fact, the same approaches can be used, such as uh, receding horizon planning that we have also utilized in some of the works. So a lot of these problems share in continuous domain similarities with nonlinear MPC and all of also the computational strategies that people utilize there can be also utilized here. So since I'm a bit over time, I'm very sorry for this, uh, but this is where I will end. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Um, we have questions? Uh, maybe maybe I'll start with a common question. I think the transition constraint view is very interesting for, in particular, at second line, we have a problem like this, where we're tuning motors and the temperature gets in the way. And so transition is really important, like where do you go from one point to the next? So we, we would need to think about trajectories ideally. So yeah, so this is, this is really exciting to, to hear about this. Uh, maybe the question on this is more practical is the type of problems you, you have tackled with these, how many parameters do you have? Like, is it it's a scalable solution or is it still at a stage where it's more demonstration of ideas? Um, so this is, this approach here is to make things practical and make things tractable. So nobody is selling a proof of concept here, that, that's for sure but some problems are inherently very, very difficult. For example, if you try to optimize a function in a high dimensional nonlinear function, smooth nonlinear function in a high dimensional space, this in fact, this problem is not solvable from the start. Putting yet another constraint on top of it, such as if you have to move in a particular dynamics, is not going to make it easier. So I would say that the, the, this use or the, the, the fact that you are restricted by the dyna uh, like dynamics is actually what is to show that this is not the challenging part. The challenging part is rather that the original problem might be, for example, challenging high dimensional or uh, yeah, difficult to model, difficult to interact with, very noisy. So these, these challenges stay, but the transition dynamics, in case it's known, is not the challenging part that I would, I would claim. Yeah. Of course, you have to be doing, you have to be interested in, in things which follow into this scheme of experimental design. So there are also other objectives which could be non-tractable. For example, one specific objective that's not tractable, could be non, which could be non-tractable is um, uh, 
when you when you have demonstrations and you're trying to reproduce them, you're rep trying to reproduce the trajectories in the same order. Uh, so effectively, you visit the states in the same order. I think this is called. Um, I just don't want to uh, term. I just lost the term right now. I think this is called. Um, sort of teaching um yeah we're well, trying to effectively from off policy data match uh match the match the policy character reproduce it so this you can also do in like an online fashion but you have this loss where i want to reproduce that trajectory that would be interactive that would be difficult to do but if you just try to do visitations if everything works on visitation spaces like many of these objectives do then the problem is not difficult So what makes this possible effectively is this observation of one and two, which uh, should be. A... Any other questions? Please, you, you mentioned near the start the collection of blood as being an example. Can you elaborate on how that fits into this? Schematic. I wasn't. I couldn't quite see the connection. Uh, could you say again? I didn't hear. Yeah, sorry. Um, I may be far from the microphone. But at near the start, you you, uh, you mentioned that the collection of blood could be optimized. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you elaborate a little bit on that setup. I couldn't quite grasp. That. Yeah. Um, so so in that sense, if what you want to do, you want to understand, let's say, um, some unknown parameters of the differential equation. So again, your your goal is to explore. But now you have some restrictions. For example, you cannot take a blood of a patient within certain time frame after you already took, took it. So you cannot do any possible experiment. Also, perhaps there is a constraint on how many times you can just take a blood per So a patient is an episode here. And with one episode, you can maybe take blood only five times and they have to be spaced by let's say two days. So these are, your, these are effectively your constraints. And now you observe multiple patients and you want to find a effective, I mean, let's, let's misuse the word treatment plan of when to draw blood in order to obtain, obtain observations which are most informative. Right, right. So it's not so much helping that, that individual patient, but future patients that have similar. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I got confused. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So this is very important because should you take the blood in the morning or in the afternoon, or you know, in rapid succession in the beginning, uh, or towards late, you have to wait a longer time. So this all depends on some on the differential equation model that's governing this process yeah. they are parameterized by a couple of models and you through this interaction you want to you want to recover uh, you want to recover these parameters and in fact this is a whole study called pharmacokinetics and these people derived uh, rigorous uh, procedures of when you should be drawing blood depending on the scheme which this drug interacts with the tissue uh, and in fact what we do what we show in this one work is that with this procedure you can recover their kind of heuristic descriptions of these rules using this procedure as a byproduct. So this is, you know, you can just plug in everything, all the description of the system, and you find the right spacing. So for example, in, the common thing would be that you, in the beginning, should draw blood very at the rapid, uh, rapid, uh, rapid intervals, and then maybe tail off. And this is something which we can completely reproduce here and completely derive from first principles. Okay, I think we should close it here and perhaps uh, uh, save some of the questions for after the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.